Hello, Louis. Hello, Matthew. How are you doing? Welcome to the next episode of The Existential Files. In the last of these, we were beginning to talk about love. And if you're willing, would you allow me just to ask you a couple more questions about your thoughts about love? Because I have been pursuing some interesting discussions about this. And I wonder if you're familiar with the work of um, Dr. H. Lewis, who once argued that the power of love was a curious thing. So do you yeah. feel that it does indeed make one man weep and another man sing? Uh, I mean, th what is it? This, this, it's an interesting thing. I know that some historians count courtly love as the beginnings of, um, you know, what, our modern conception of love and, you know, courtly love in the medieval times. And I, I remember reading a bit of Chaucer and stuff. It all seemed very effeminate, if you ask me, not very masculine. I'm, I must admit, I'm more of a hit them over the head and take them back to my cave kind of man. Well, it, it does come across that way. So by, even at me, my, my, this uh, person over here who's not well read, courtly love... Courtly love, yes. Courtly love, and precisely, Court. what do we mean by courtly love? Courtly love would be the kind of love that you see in a kind of a, a medieval court, um, and it and it and it was kind of the 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 courtly the 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 princely man um, trying to get win the hand of the fair maiden. So we talk about you know being you know are you courting, are you a courting, courting relationship? So it's yeah. very much of that era at least and it's not a term maybe that nowadays but still the sense of do you, do you still think that we have this kind of these court this courtly love i think that well i mean if you look back to i mean even what 40s 50s couples were courting you um think, you don't think anymore i think that the tinder age ha is destroying a lot of this i mean if you're not getting a, a blowjob on the first date you're um, you're failing i think at the moment but then do, um, do, do all all current uh, humans only explore these relationships through tinder well one i'm not a young man anymore so i can't say i have my fingers on the pulse of of anything of um of modern dating i think we'd have to get a young person in to find out but my impression my my impressions of dating in the 21st century is very much that it is well it is certainly different from when i was 17 i was 17 in about 1996 i think um and uh, it definitely seems a lot a lot more um well there's a lot more pornography which i think puts a lot of pressure on people Okay, and in terms of in terms of then the the courtly love and the advent of Tinder, so we're I'm trying to say, okay, I've asked this question in obviously a mildly humorous way, in this idea of the power of love. Yeah, which obviously. Said, so the Dr. H. Lewis was of course our good friend Huey Lewis, who would say the power true. of love is a curious thing, makes a one man weep, makes another man sing. So the very least they we talk this idea that that songs of that nature will talk about the power of love because in the previous podcast. We're very much focusing on, at least from an evolutionary perspective, your take on, well, things that we might now describe as love, if we really trace it back to the beginnings, we can look at actually it's quite mechanical going on. There's something quite uh, organic in that sense, something which is needed from a, as part of an evolutionary process. And now we get in contemporary discussions, whether it's over the last 100 years, 500 years, or the last 20 years, we talk about this idea of love in the way it often then manifests itself on things like Valentine's Day, to say, well, it's talking about something that often is described as a, in quotes, force or notion, which, again, is at the very least a curious thing. It's, it's something which actually <laughs> maybe binds us together. It's something which we all often seek, whether it is through courtly love or through Tinder, unless maybe through Tinder we're not seeking love, we're seeking something else. So I'm just wondering, Given the, the contemporary views on things like love, whether it's in popular music or in literature or where it might be, how, what are our thoughts about that? What are your thoughts about that, Louis? Do you see this as all abstraction from this fundamental original beginnings, or is there something else here we need to kind of understand, at the very least, from a psychological point of view? Yeah, I mean, me. uh, no, th there's definitely, a, say, should we say, an existential aspect to love. And so, from the, and that I mean is, yes, biology gives us. The, the substrates of love, but but you know what we make of it is up is up to us and and isn't necessarily connected to um to to what biology demands of us. I mean, for example, you know even if we take homosexuality, for example, which some people like to think may be some kind of uh, biological predisposition, but you know I I think it's perfectly reasonable to fall in love with somebody regardless of their biological sex. 
that um, you know, just because biology might say this is who you should love doesn't mean you have to love them. And that's the kind of, as I say, the existential aspect to love. I mean, from my perspective, love is a, we're talking about very complex things. Chaotic. Louis, Louis yeah. in a very roundabout way, are you telling yeah. me that you love me? I, I do love you. And it's in a purely, I mean, not in a, um, a throbbing blowjob kind of way. I, I would say it's a definitely a, a platonic love. What actually. a lovely image that is. Oh, but it's definitely platonic love. I mean, uh, on the other hand. Well, um, even that then, yeah. let's even f explore that platonic love. Platonic Again, love. How, how, yeah, so how are we distinguishing platonic love from the love that you normally see uh, a, a sexual act maybe taking part? So are, are we still talking about the same basic principle? It's evolved out to this idea of, well, there's, there's a need for this stuff going on. You know, I'm just referring back to a previous podcast where you were saying, well, there's the mechanics of it and the evolutionary aspect of it. And now we've got the face the question of existential love and even the different aspects of love. Is that, name of a, is that name of a musical? Yeah. Aspects of love to say, well, this term love often describes a whole range of things that will include love for another person that has no sexual element to it. But then for many, this idea of romantic love has some elements typically where there is a sexual attraction, a sexual relationship going on. Yeah, I mean, but we're talking about something which is very varied. So, for example, you know, the uh, people, uh, you know, we talk about kin. And so you love your family and you might say, well, that's partly because you share genetics. And I think in a very, very early podcast, we talked about social insects and why an ant might give up its reproductive success for to help its siblings. And we said that, you know, that's because actually it can be more successful genetically if it does that. And I think, you know, kin selection, if you save five of your brothers, but you die in the process, well, you've actually, that outcome genetically is better than if you have a baby, you know, and let five of your brothers die. Um, so, uh, but, and, and, uh, even, and, and, that, and often that would that be the kind of act then, it would be just maybe described as an act of love, whether or not you say, okay, we can explain it genetically, it's often then will be labels being to so-called sacrifice oneself or an act of saving others, one's kith and kin, <laughs> and you die in the process, it's an act of love. I mean, it's whether you would, I mean, it's, I think some people find that, or think that I'm trying to diminish the experience by saying, you know, by putting it in these terms. But I mean, I don't see it as diminishing anything. I mean, we are all of us related. I mean, we are all of us an African ape. I mean, we're all Africans. I mean, you know, whether your skin is black or white, and we all evolved in Af Africa not that long ago. We're all of us cousins. So we, in fact, should help each other. We are all kin. And, and, I was going to say, and we, in and terms we of the all... sexual side of it, it's either way it's incest. Either way. Well, it is you know, it's something all the family can enjoy. Um, <laughs> fun, fun for the family. I mean, well, we, we are all cousins. So, you know, there, there is a, uh, an aspect to the fact that we should all love each other. Now, I'm not a, quote, humanist. I don't massively identify as a humanist. But I do think that, you know, we are all cousins. We are all basically the same creature. And, you know, the, any difference between us is very, very small genetically uh, and biologically. And, um, you know, we, love is a very varied experience. It can be negative. It can be positive. Um, uh, and it's, I don't think it's something that you can explain in a single breath or, or in a single podcast or, you know. 140 characters. 140 characters. Um, and each of us, I mean, there is, a, there is a, a historical aspect to it. I mean, each of us has our own emotional love history. I mean, you know, I, I think, you know, I've been married and divorced. I mean, I married the very first girl that I kissed. So the very first romantic kiss that I ever had when I was 17, that girl I married. Now that's kind of unusual. Most people, I think, have a couple more. Try different. You know, I, they try a few more people before they settle on marrying somebody. Um, and again, that, has that taint? Uh, I say tainted. Has it? Has it changed the way I see love? Or has <laughs> tainted it tainted love? Tainted love. Um, Not all yeah, them there for us all. Pro probably. I mean, you know, I, I probably um, would like to have kissed a few more girls before I married one. That's like another song as well, isn't it? Kissing no, more girls or something. Uh, 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 no offense uh, to my ex-wife, obviously. You know, she was a very nice girl. Um, and the question I'd want to ask, but I'm very sensitive in terms of this being part of a podcast, but then in terms of the relationship of love there, 
would you, I mean, and, or more generally, let's sort of step back from that in terms of this notion of being in love. Often talk about, people talk about, so there we've, we've looked at platonic love. I think we sort of say, well, we're all Africans, we're all cousins. We, you know, if we were humanist or taking that approach, or you, you were saying, not describing myself as humanist, recognizing that it's all separate organisms, it makes sense and one should appropriately love each other, as in show care and attention for each other and so on. Um, and that broadly, we're talking about that, I'm guessing, in the context of platonic love. Whereas in romantic love, there is this element people talk about falling in love. Any thoughts on this notion of falling in love? Is this something yeah. which is a real phenomenon for you? Is it something which you oh. experience, anything like that? I mean, obviously, again, um, you know, Falling in love is a kind of a, an incitement to reproduce, as as in feeling hungry is an incitement to eat a food, or wanting to defecate is an incitement to shit yourself. Um, I mean, yes, I've been in love. I've fallen in love. I've felt those experiences. They can be extremely exciting. It can be extremely. It can be a kind of madness. I mean, it can. Um, it can feel very strange and overwhelming. And I can understand. You know, Valentine's Day. If you're in love can be a very overwhelming. If you're not in love, it can be very distressing. You know, it can be something that you want. Unrequited love can be something very um, upsetting. And and, um, but, and and certainly, it, 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 it is, I think, on one level, an incitement to behave, an incitement to reproduce. You know, biologically, you know, you are wanting to have sex to then reproduce. Um, but also sex is fun. Sex is an amazing experience, or it can be, certainly. Um, um, and um, Again, we are kind of drug addicts, you know. If you, as I said earlier, you know, we, the, if if this system is is about endogenous opiates, you know, rewarding you. I mean, it, uh, one of the questions I come back to is why does the poppy, why does the poppy produce opium, you know, um, and, and why do we have heroin addicts? And and we're all a kind of a drug addict to our endogenous opiates, really. I mean, would 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 we have sex if it felt horrible? And this is where we're coming back to, again, linking this, because the idea that as largely chemical beings, or you could say largely, one could say fully chemical beings, we are responding to physical processes. I think one of the very early podcasts, we talked about the role of, of chemistry in terms of the nature of science and the extent to which science can deal with and help us understand the universe and or at least our place within it. So again, here we're using this example to say, well, we can look at aspects of love and even the experience of falling in love where we have some understanding of how that works and understanding it from a neurochemical perspective that when we experience the feeling of falling in love there are neurochemical transactions happening that help explain why you might have these experiences where you may do you say you use the term madness or people might say that actually you are not in control of your senses as it were when you are in this full flows of being in love, yet I'm still questioning, okay, we can have a very good and, and full understanding of what it means to have these experiences from a biological perspective. My question comes back to, and it's back to maybe the existential type question is, so does that capture all of it? Is, is that a satisfactory explanation of the whole experience of falling in love? Is it something that can be explained fully by just neurotransmitters? And related chemicals or is that just part of the explanation or an explanation at that level it misses some other level but i think i mean i think one of the things i've tried to communicate my blog uh, blog recently is the idea that just just because the substrate is simple doesn't mean that you can't communicate things that that, that the substrate that people developing the substrate didn't even know were possible so you know when, when language was being developed no one thought that Shakespeare would happen, you know, or that Hamlet would be written. And, and so I don't think it diminishes Hamlet that the substrate of language was ug ug and ug ug. You know, at the end of the day, that was, that's the historical kind of trajectory of language. And it doesn't diminish Shakespeare any, any the less. And the same for human beings. I mean, you know, for love. I think that just because the substrate of love is identifiable is a kind of reward system has evolved from from simple substrates it doesn't necessarily diminish the experience of love love can be a wonderful thing i mean it it, it is a a prickly it can be prickly it can you know i think if you love somebody 
And for example, I mean, you know, with the death of my brother, you know, I loved that person perhaps more than almost any other person in the world. And for him to die hurt, has hurt me immensely. Now, if somebody I didn't love died, I'm not hurt by that at all because, you know, again, you invest something. Oh, that's, that's my, I have to, I have to answer the door, I'm afraid. It'll give me two seconds. <laughs> we'll edit this out, folks. Um, I, they, not I was, lots of Valentine's Day cards then. No, no, yeah, absolutely tons. The, the, the postman was, his sack was overflowing with the Valentine's cards for me. Um, I was just saying that, that the more that you, I think, invest in a relationship in, with love, the more it can hurt you, you know, if things go wrong. And so it isn't, I don't think it's a very, I don't think it's a simple thing. Love. No, we're, we're not in any way suggesting it's a simple thing. And even if we have an understanding of it to the biological aspect, as a biological level, I think we're sort of saying that just, even if we're able to understand it at that level, it doesn't diminish, you know, the phenomenon, of it, the experience of it, the meaning people attach to it. And for some, it may well be the, the, the songwriters, the poets, the novelists and so on, who will write about these ideas, are, are, are actually talking about something over and above the biology of it. That it's not just, and kind of, you often say, well, for say, not just saying just, it diminishes that side of it, but it, it only captures part of the, the understanding of it. To say that actually when you're falling in love, yes, we can look at the, the, the way the chemicals work and the reason why you have these experiences is the way that chemicals in your brain are affecting you in such a way that you will, of course, have the phenomenology of what you're describing. And what I'm wondering and con con contemplating, looking at is, okay, knowing that anyway, is there something additional about it that is, that is important and meaningful beyond I mean, just simply it's what's emerged out of the biology of it? Uh, By all means, uh, you can write all these things, but essentially sure. it's, a, it's a phenomenon from the biology. Is there something else beyond that? Because some would argue love, in quotes, being a so-called driving force of everything else. That if, if we accept this, this role of love, how we go about, about our daily lives, and it's something we often do ask in this question of, of existentially how we live our lives. If we live one which is, in quotes, guided by love, it'd be a very different ex experience from one that isn't guided by love. Does that make I mean, sense? Uh one of my one of I mean one of my reactions to that is you know one of the reasons that I'm not a quote scientist anymore is because I don't think that the scientific explanation does capture everything it is to be a human being and uh, for, you talk about art, art and I mean you know a, a novel which you know describes love and describes loss can be far more moving and capture exactly what it is to be a human being or, or facets of what it is to be a human being, than, a, than a, a scientific paper on endorphin release in, you know, in, in two individuals. So, I mean, yes, I'm, I'm extremely sympathetic uh, and, and totally with you on, on the fact that, you know, your, your existential, uh, you know, artistic, you know, understanding of love can be a far more rich and perhaps even more accurate representation of what it is to be in love. Um, but I do, in terms of it, love, uh, uh, you know, being a guide, I mean, I'm not entirely convinced that love uh, as a guide, I mean, again, you know, I bring it back because for me, you know, love is endorphins and endorphin is, you know, endorphins are a kind of endogenous morphine. Right? And so, you know, I do, I do come down to the fact that, you know, if the drug addict says, you know, I, I live my life for opium, you know, yes, okay, it, it feels great, your life is wonderful, uh, but I, I'm not entirely convinced that love is the, the guiding force in the universe, it, any more than a, a drug, it, you know, it, opium is a guiding force in the universe. You can, you can certainly wrap yourself in the cotton wool of love, and it can protect you from a hell of a lot of the pain in the universe, but I'm not entirely convinced that it's any more than cotton wool. However, and we can end on this note, are we agreed that indeed the power of love is at least a curious thing? It most certainly is a bejesusly curious thing. And it can indeed make one man weep and another man sing. It has for, for thousands of years, I'm sure, and will continue for as long as the human race is here. And on that note, folks, on that bombshell. On that bomb have a happy Valentine's Day. And you. Speak or not. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.